Good morning, dear brothers and sisters of Christ. Great to be back with you for our weekly chat. Hoping that the past week has been a blessed one for you and your loved ones, that you're doing well, that you're staying safe, you're taking the time to be family. But also, most importantly, that as we move into the Nativity Lenten season, you're doing things good for your soul. This morning, let's discuss what secular society has done with the Feast of the Nativity of our Lord, with Christmas, and why what they've done has had profound effects on our younger generations, in all of our parishes, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. So stay tuned. As always in our podcast, if you have any comments or questions, enter them below, and I'll try to get to them as quickly as possible. Let's begin with our prayer to the Holy Spirit. O Heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who are everywhere and fillest all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity and save our souls. O oh, good one. So I think there's a good motto that Orthodox Christians can, can, can adapt, or adopt, I should say, as, as we move through the nativity season, especially here in our Western culture, America. And that is, fight for Christ at Christmas. Because I really believe that uh, this whole trend towards secularism is really starting to have a, a negative influence on, on the younger generations in our, in, our, in our families. Why do I say that? If you watch secular media, most in the media see Santa and shopping as the start and the end of Christmas. And now, of course, as you know, um, They've moved away from the greetings of Merry Christmas to Happy Holidays. They don't call it the Christmas season, they call it the holiday season. Um, and one wonders if that trend continues, will it still remain a holiday when the holy days of Christmas is finally forgotten by secular society and mainstream media? Think back for a second. Dear viewers, when Clement Moore's A Visit from St. Nicholas, which we know as Twas the Night Before Christmas, was part of the cultural mainstream, today political correctness prohibits any mention of the poem because of its implicit religious tone. Consider just the first few verses. Twas the night before Christmas, when all through the house, not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. The stockings were hung by the chimney with care in hopes that St. Nicholas soon would be there. The children were nestled all snug on their beds while visions of sugar plums danced in their heads. Two obvious sins against politically correct dogma are already committed in these opening lines. The first is the mention of the word Christmas. The second, the mention of the word saint. Of course, sugar plums passes muster. Do I sound extreme? I don't think so. I bet you if we polled children under the age of 14 and see how many of them know the Christmas standards that we grew up with, it came upon midnight clear, O little town of Bethlehem, joy to the world, O holy night. I think we would find that most children do not know them at all. They will, however, be able to sing Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer, Frosty the Snowman, Jingle Bells, maybe even Winter Wonderland, definitely All I Want for Christmas is You, with no problem at all. There's nothing inherently wrong with these songs, but Christmas is more than innocuous fun, or so we once believed. Viewers, 
Those of you who are parents and grandparents, take this quiz and give it to your children and grandchildren. What are you thinking about? What are their holiday visions, quote, dancing in your head? And let them give you some answers. And the second one, what are you really looking forward to as the holidays are approaching? My experience as a parish priest for, for many years is that most answers from our children would be they're thinking about toys, about gadgets, about special clothes that they want to receive. Most adults would answer, I believe, the family meal, getting together with relatives and close friends. In the secular world today, the answers above would merit, merit an A+. If life has no religious dimension, if God is not a part of personal life, then he will be abstracted from the culture as well. What then is left except the accumulation of more things? From a Christian perspective, however, the answers, of course, and our responses along those lines would merit an F. Remember the words of Christ, for where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verse 21. These words of Christ were actually part of the Sermon on the Mount, in which Christ expounded on what the kingdom of God required. Again, quoting, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust consume, or where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust consumes, and where thieves do not break in and steal. Matthew 6, verses 19 and 20. So ask ourselves this question. How far we have strayed from the teachings of our Lord in his kingdom. In our Orthodox teaching, all commitment to Christ must begin in our homes. All teaching about what is the essence of the kingdom of God must begin in the home. Thus, if the handing over of tradition begins in the home, so does the breaking with the past that leads to the homes becoming secularized. In Orthodox Christianity, the home is called the domestic church, correctly implying that all Christian teaching is first cultivated in the home and then in the parish community. The con conception of the domestic church actually arises from the home churches of early Christianity. As Christians were no longer welcome in the Jewish temple, they, they brought vestiges of synagogue worship into their own homes, along with early prayers of the church and the Eucharist. The structure of this early worship is still evident in the Orthodox Divine Liturgy today. St. Paul himself talked about these home churches in his epistle to the Romans when he said, quote, Greet Prisca and Aquila, my fellow workers in Christ Jesus. Greet also the church in their house. Romans 16, verses 3 to 5. To the people of Corinth, he wrote, The churches of Asia send greetings. Aquila and Prissa, together with the church in their house, send you hearty greetings in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 16, verse 19. After the Roman persecution of Christians was lifted and Christianity ceased being an outlaw religion, with Constantine's Edict of Milan in 311, Christians were able to build their own churches. Nevertheless, the centrality of family as the center of church life was maintained. Even today, the leaders of the domestic church are the husband and the wife, the mother and father. The words of Christ as recorded by St. Matthew, chapter 18, verse 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them, are especially relevant to his presence in the domestic church. Husbands and wives are uniquely suited and equipped for domestic ministry. The inherent dignity and importance of the Christian parenting is revealed through, pr through a prayer read by the priest in the Orthodox wedding service when the couple is first married. And I'm quoting, Unite them in, mi in one mind and one flesh and grant unto them fair children, for education is the faith and fear. This prayer embodies the Christ-centered parental vocation and reveals the theological underpinnings of the domestic church. So what, is it, what are we saying here? We're saying that parents 
by the leaders and teachers in the domestic church. A true Orthodox Christian domestic church in our day should look like, but is not limited to, something like this. Jesus Christ is, is at the center or hub. Husbands and wives as such and as fathers and mothers should be the leaders of the church at home in Christ's name. They should bless one another and their children, bless the food which is partaken, giving thanks for all that God has provided, their home, their furnishings, etc. Thanking God for their health and their talents, and lead by the sanctity of their conduct as well as their words. We nurture the spiritual vitality of the domestic church in several ways. For example, parents can remember the feast of the church with prayers, and they can recite the tropars or the conducts of those feast days and explain the significance of the feast day to their children or go over the epistles and gospel readings for the day. Let me stop there for a second. Because I, I, I realize as I'm, as I'm sharing this with you, and those of you who are viewing it and listening, and especially those who catch up later on of the younger generations, I, I, my own personal thought is, you're going to see this and hear this and think, wow, that is so way far-fetched, Father. However, where your heart is, that's where your treasure is. Other things we can do. Daily scripture can be read and discussed. Daily prayers, at least at morning and evening, should be a vital part of the domestic church activities. All family members should take part in these prayers and readings. Following the sign of the cross made by the father and their mother, each family member may take a turn reading a line from the prayers scripture or reading text of the day. The leaders of the domestic church should also be theologians and educators of themselves and their children imparting knowledge and practice. In other words, parents, even grandparents, need to take the time to know about the feast, about the church teachings, and then in their own way and bring it down to the level where our children can understand and, 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 and comprehend, explain things to them. So let's focus on Christmas now. How many people know the full theological meaning of the Nativity Fast? Excuse me, of the Nativity Feast. If we don't, we become, we become susceptible to the secularizing energy fed by a commercial, commercial spirit of the culture today. Put another way, one of the most powerful things we can do for our families to counter the slide into the spiritual wasteland of the commercial culture is to deepen our understanding about the nativity of Christ. We must teach ourselves first, then we can teach our children and grandchildren. So let me give, give some, some background here. It starts way back in Genesis. Adam and Eve were made in God's image and called to be like him. They started out in paradise with the potential of full union with God, but still experienced testing. They failed the test by the sin of pride. They are cast out of paradise into the world and are disordered inclined to sin, and destined for death. We are the offspring of Adam and partake of these same maladies. God responded to this deep catastrophe in many ways, all leading to the incarnation of his son. A signature event was the calling of Abraham, then he was known as Abraham, out of a land riddled with paganism and polytheism. God made a covenant with Abraham that made him the leader of God's people, the people of the first covenant, Genesis 17, and the father of many nations. As the people grew in number, and over the course of centuries, various prophets emerged, among them Isaiah, who said that God would send a Messiah, a deliverer and king. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, meaning God with us. He shall eat curds and honey when he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. Isaiah 7, 14 and 15. The prophet described Emmanuel. For to us a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end, upon the throne of David, 
and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. Isaiah chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. And this is the prophet Jeremiah. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch. He shall reign as king and deal wisely, shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days Judah will be saved, and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Jeremiah 23, verses 5 and 6. The prophet Micah told us the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Quoting now, But you, O Bethlehem, Ephrathah, who are little to me among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler of Israel, whose origin is from of old, from ancient days. Micah 5, chapter 2. When Jesus was born, he took on our flesh, but remained God thereby, enabling us to partake of his nature. In his second epistle, St. Peter wrote, May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, to the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence, for which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, that through these you may escape from the corruption that is in the world because of passion and become partakers of the divine nature. The whole life of Jesus his teachings, the Last Supper, Calvary, his death and resurrection is tied to this. So parents, grandparents, te leaders and teachers of the domestic church have to work with their children to make these connections between the feasts such as the Nativity and all other feasts of the church. And there are some practical things that we can do. Orthodox Christians are well aware that the Advent season starts approximately 40 days before the feast itself. Religious Western Christians have a beautiful Advent practice, the Advent calendar. This tradition has and can be modified for the longer Eastern pre-nativity season. <clears throat> Many domestic church families will find, if they go online and, and search out the Advent calendar uh, from various Orthodox sites, that they can make their own Advent calendar. And they can modify the calendar by putting in different activities for each day or different readings. Family prayer time and discussions of the passages is a beautiful way to prepare for Christ's birth. The meaning of the gifts of, given by the Magi, as prophesied in, in, in the prophecy of Micah. And the giving and receiving of gifts today could be the one topic addressed at home in the domestic church. The quotes from the Church Fathers on the Feast of Nativity and the other feasts of the Church compiled by the Fathers may be especially helpful. Some parents may need a refresher course in making such connections themselves. Parents, take a refresher course. Take the time to see the importance in the different feasts, but especially now during the Advent season. Focus on the Nativity and how we can import upon our children and grandchildren the beauty and the power and the glory of the feast itself. You know, talk, talk to your church school teachers. Talk to your parish priest. Any questions you may have on how to do this, there'll be, there may also be a wonderful source for other discussion topics or projects as you work through an Advent uh, calendar. Discussing within the domestic church how to keep the spirit of Christmas alive throughout the year would also be in order. Ask the children how to put into practice the often quoted phrase, it's better to give than to receive. The spirit goes completely against self-centered and materialistic culture that we live in. It will probably be an uphill battle, but always pointing to Christ as our model. When gifts are received, tie this into being thankful and giving glory to God for all things. In the skies, our children can also be taught how to share what they have been given. Sharing can start first among family members and then extend it to others. Now, understand something, my dear viewers. In no way do I want to take away the joy of Christmas, especially for our children and grandchildren. 
the cheer and the glee on the faces of, of our children when they first look at the Christmas tree and the presents around the tree or whatever is, is precious. It's priceless. I get it. The words of our Lord, who, who also loved children, comes to mind. Then children were brought to him that he might lay his hands upon them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people, but Jesus said, Let the children come to me. Do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And laid his hands upon the children, and they went and, and went away. Matthew 19, verses 13 to 15. The important thing, in my humble opinion, we need to learn how to Christify all things. Keep Christ in Christmas. It adds to the joy. Unfortunately, an aggressive secularism takes hold in the culture. Families leave off the important spiritual dimensions of family life. There are to be no mention of Christ, no blessings of prayer, no worship, no praise or thanksgiving. Names are changed, holiday season, to purposely eradicate the holiness of ancient holy days like Christmas from the cultural memory. Um, I have said many times to, to people who have asked me, or even to parishioners in, in discussions, rather than greet someone with Merry Christmas or Happy Holidays, why not greet them with Christ is born? It's, it's the Orthodox greeting for the Feast and the Nativity of our Lord, for Christmas. Right away, it puts the focus where it needs to be, that the Son of God has, has become human, is born for us, and leads to our salvation. As you well know, not too many years ago, any public display of commitment to Christ was considered to be spiritually inappropriate. Reticence was prescribed, and any behavior short of it seemed to be as was seen as hypocritical and pharisaical. This practice was based on Christ's indictment of the Pharisees. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within they are full of dead man's bones and all uncleanness. St. Peter of Damascus warned, Approval and gratitude, however, are due not to the man who receives the gifts, but to him who bestows them. Should such a person thank the giver, he does so in the same way as the Pharisees. And, and, and he says, I thank thee, God, that I am not like the other men. The evangelist, or rather God who knew men's hearts, was right to say that he spoke to himself, for the Pharisee was not speaking to God. Today, and you all know this, Publicly acknowledging being a follower of Christ is considered socially and politically despicable. While martyrdom in today's society is not physical, to witness Christ is to suffer psychological and social torture. True Christians are assailed, they're laughed at, they're mocked, they're reviled, they're verbally defied, and the brunt of scatological humor. The root of the word witness is from the Greek word Martyria. This is thus to be a modern martyr for Christ is simply to declare oneself to be his follower and stand up for his teaching. So how do we witness to Christ? We can put a nativity scene on lawns or windows as to be able to be seen by, pastor, pastor, by people who go by. We can wear a Christ birth-centered pin on our clothes. When someone greets us with happy holidays, we could answer, indeed, Christ is born glorify him. We can start out a meeting with others with a similar statement. Have a glorious feast of Christ's birth. Children should be greeted, could be greeted with a phrase like, Happy birthday, Jesus. Finally, let's bring back the old one that we all know, Merry Christmas. During a meal with family, friends or acquaintances, one can say, I would like to say a prayer of blessing. This is going to be done throughout the year. Among non-Christians non or even unchurched people, a simple statement can be very powerful. I would just like, for example, I would just like to call to mind the birth of my Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. Blessings to all. Among those who are committed Christians, of course, recall one of the scriptural passages referring to our Lord's birth that can be recited, and, and a more direct prayer can be direct prayer can be prayed. 
one of the things that I always try to do during the nativity season, I, ne I never let any secular greeting go by unanswered. My response, always given in charity, because I always want witness to our Lord's birth, is Christ is born. Glorify him. So, a lot to think about, I, I, I realize. But I think it's, it's really crucial that that we take the time and really try to shift our focus. And, and you know, it's so easy to get caught up in all the, the, the secular stuff about you know, the holidays. Let's shift our focus. Now is the time to get back to Christ. So that's it. That's all I have for today. Let me close with our prayer to our Holy Mother of God, as is our custom. Steadfast protection of Christians, constant advocate before the Creator. Do not despise the cry of us sinners, but in your goodness come speedy to help those who call upon you in faith. Hasten to hear our petition and to intercede for us a Theotokos, for we always protect those who honor you. Dear viewers, thank you so much for being with us. We love you. We know that uh, in lifting each other up in prayer, as I lift you up in prayer, we're always united in Christ. God bless, and have a blessed Nativity Fast.